So you know how every game system has that feature or two that we just kind of forget about over time and that even the developer quietly drops? You know, an expansion slot that never gets used, or the PS3's 3D TV compatibility, or the Kinect, you know, stuff like that? Well, among all of the Nintendo Wii's quirks and unique features is one really neat one that went so underused that Nintendo just straight up removed it, and no, it's not the Wii Shop Channel. I'm talking about the ability to save data directly to your Wii remote and bring it with you to other Wii systems, sort of like a precursor to Amiibos. Now, most wireless controllers, of course, do have some amount of data that's saved on them, whether it's controller firmware or pairing data or anything like that, but that's not what I'm referring to here. See, built into every early Wiimote is a ROM chip that would allow you to transfer data to and from your system, so that you could do things like, for example, bring your Pokémon Battle Revolution team to a friend's house and battle with it, or if you were playing Monster Hunter Co-op, you could bring your controller and character with you, save the rewards from your hunts, and earn them back on your own system once you got back home. It wouldn't really be Nintendo if they didn't fully embrace the local experience after all. Seemingly the main reason for this feature existing, though, is so that you could save up to 10 Miis from your system to the controller and then bring them over to your friends' houses and export them there. But if you're like me, you either totally forgot or never even knew this was a thing and instead you just made your Miis from scratch at every new friend's house. Since there were a ton of Wii systems that weren't connected to the internet back then, using the Mii Contest slash Check Me Out channel to upload and download Miis wasn't always an option, which might be another part of why this feature exists. It's hard to say though, it honestly might have just been an afterthought considering the size of the storage available on the controller. And speaking of, let's go into the hardware details for a sec before talking about some of the other games that used this memory. This ROM chip is a whopping 128 kilobits in size. I, I made that sound big, but that's only 16 kilobytes, about half the size of the original Super Mario Bros. on the NES. Or, for a more save data oriented comparison, PlayStation 1 memory cards could store 8 times as much data as your Wii controller could. The PS1 used save blocks as its memory unit analog, sort of like the GameCube and Wii did afterwards. Actually, fun fact, each save block on the Wii was 128 kilobytes, or one PS1 memory card, and in the PS1's case, each of the 15 blocks that were available on any official memory card would take up just over four times as much data as this Wii Remote ROM chip had in total. So obviously you weren't going to be saving full games on your controller, although that would have been really cool. Better yet, 10 kilobytes of that 16 were actually reserved data for storing things like calibration data, registers for certain controller peripherals, and seemingly allowing for the possibility of controller firmware updates by passing the data through this chip to another chip on the controller, although because there was no firmware update for the Wii remotes, that's more of a theory by modders. Of the remaining 6 kilobytes that you could use as a player, two of that was reserved for saving up to 10 Miis, like I mentioned earlier, and then the remaining four was usable by any game that could figure out a good use for that little space. And surprisingly, there were somehow more than just one or two games that took on that challenge, some of them even coming out years after the fact. Not, um... Not many more games, but by my count, 8 to 10 games and one app had Wii Remote Save Data functionality. And I wouldn't be shocked whatsoever if I'm missing one or two because this feature is so under the radar that even Nintendo's official site barely discusses it, and after spending about 10 hours digging through troves of niche Wii games, I'm ready to call it quits before I Wii snap. So let's talk about the games that I found. First up are the system's launch games, where you'd expect the vast majority of these games to come from, since usually the very earliest titles on any given console try to pack in every gimmick they possibly can before the less useful features are quickly dropped. Surprisingly, only a few of these titles actually did come out in 2006 or 2007, though. In Pokémon Battle Revolution, like I touched on a bit earlier, the Wii Remote saving was used for, I shit you not, they're called Battle Passes. So the way this game operated was that every Pokémon trainer received a Battle Pass in order to compete in Poketopia, the city featured in this game. This Battle Pass would display trainer data, like their outfit and chosen catchphrases, as well as the Pokémon team that saved to that particular pass. There are three Battle Pass types here in Poketopia. Rental Passes, which are given to you in the game itself. Custom Passes, if you transfer Pokémon data over from Diamond, Pearl, Platinum, Heart Gold, or Soul Silver. Or Friend Passes, which were what you would save to the controller to put them on friends' save files at their house. You could also get Friend Passes just by battling online. 
The second launch window game to use this feature is a series with the same level of prestige as Pokemon 2. That would be Super Swing Golf. Okay, well, maybe not quite the same level, but in this one, you could save your character and their stats slash build to bring over to a friend's house. However, if you wanted to save data from one game to your Wiimote, you should probably be prepared to wipe whatever data you already had in that whopping four kilobytes of free space. You're not likely to find any two of these games that are kind enough to share. And then, of course, there's the Me Channel and Me Plaza, where you would deposit Mii's after you've copied them to the remote. These ones are more of an app than a game, of course, so it's the technicality of a bunch, but it was a launch feature. And if you really wanted to argue this, you could say that the Wii Remote Save feature was usable in another 100-ish games besides the ones I'm talking about, since once you transfer a Mii from your controller, it'd be usable on that Wii in any game that uses Mii's, whether that's Wii Fit, Mario Kart, or the dozens of games that use Mii's as your save icon and nothing else. By the way, for how prevalent Mii's were, it's kind of surprising browsing the comprehensive list and seeing how few actually used Mii's when you look back. But since just about none of those games directly support the actual transfer process from system to controller and vice versa, I'm not going to count them here. The two I will count, however, are Wii Sports and Wii Play, because at one point this Mii transfer feature ended up being removed from the Mii channel and other system level features of later model Wiis. I couldn't check every single one of the Wii Insert Subtitle Here games because I don't have all of them, but at least in these two you could still finish up that Mii transfer process from controller to system, although your character's sports stats wouldn't come with it sadly. Once we move past the Wii's launch window, we've got to jump ahead to 2008 to get to the next game on this list, Super Smash Bros. Brawl. Although Mii's were considered as a possible playable character that they could have included in Brawl for, and this is a quote, about a minute, after that minute Sakurai said no to the idea because he was afraid that it could be used for bullying. Thinking about that possibility though, not the bullying part, but the, the Mii Fighters part, seeing how the Mii Fighters eventually worked when they were in Smash 4 and Smash Ultimate, it might have potentially made for the most comprehensive use of this Wiimote transfer feature. Instead, what you can do here is save your control layout to your Wiimote so that you can bring it over and it's ready to go when you visit friends, rather than have to spend a minute setting up your own profile on every new console you play on. The only other 2008 game that used this feature was Carnival Games Mini Golf, the second golf game on this list, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice. This was one of those games that decided not to use Miis and instead give you your own Mii-like avatar, which was another fun trend during the Wii era as studios tried to create their own fad. That's all this one did though, you just transferred your avatar to your Wiimote and then brought it over to your friend's house if, for whatever reason, you wanted to play Carnival Games Mini Golf at their house with your own character. There's no stats or anything, and this game-specific avatar category is what I'm guessing any of the games that I might have missed would fall into as far as Wii transfer stuff goes. Actually, the final game to release that has controller save data, September 2010's Club Penguin Game Day, is also one of these, so I'll just mention it here and get it out of the way. Perhaps the most noteworthy Wii series to use store brand Miis is the My Sims franchise, which replaced normal Sims with, well, My Sims. And it's actually thanks to this series that this video I'm making right now even exists. While I was working on my video covering My Sims, I discovered that 2009's My Sims Racing had maybe the coolest implementation of the Wiimote save function, a thing that, again, I had completely forgotten existed. See, My Sims Racing might sound like a shitty cash-in cart game to capitalize on yet another gaming fad of that era, but it's actually not just competent, but genuinely really fun, one of the better cart games out there that doesn't have Mario, Sonic, or Crash on the box. It limits the gimmicky motion controls to just shaking up to jump, it's got creative levels, and it's got fully customizable carts that let you fine-tune the stats and looks of your vehicle. You can save up to one car of each of the three sizes, small, medium, and large, and transfer these along with your own MySim to other friends' Wiis by sending that data to and from your controller. That way you wouldn't have to just use a stock vehicle or put together your own Frankenstein cart based on whatever items your friend had unlocked, you can just use the cart that you know is perfect for you. Now you've just got to find a friend who bought My Sims Racing on the Wii. Kinda surprisingly, none of the other My Sims games ended up utilizing this feature. It does make sense since all but the Bad Party game are predominantly single-player experiences, but since the first two My Sims games are sort of Animal Crossing adjacent, I'm almost a little surprised that you couldn't transfer your villager to the controller and then give them to a friend's town so they could live there too. 
Now, if you want to hear more about that series when you're done here, go check out that video. It's actually a really interesting franchise that stood out way more than I expected given its, well, shovelware look and reputation, and that four of the six games in the My Sims franchise released in a calendar year. There's even an official Dead Space crossover because they were made by some of the same team. That doesn't get you to watch, I don't know what will. Just a few days after My Sims Racing released, Pokemon Rumble dropped in Japan. In this weird little beat-em-up game, the first downloadable WiiWare title, and maybe the only one to use the controller saving gimmick, you could save up to a dozen of your Pokemon to the Wiimote and bring them to a friend's house for co-op. Your Pokemon don't level up in this game though, so it's not like you get an actual reward or experience to bring back home for doing so, it's just for bringing whatever ones you have with you. About six weeks after Rumble, though, Japanese players did get a game that used the Wii Remote to transfer rewards from local co-op, and it's the final game we're going to talk about today, Monster Hunter Tri, which released in America and elsewhere the following year. In addition to having a seamless online co-op feature that let up to four players work together in the single-player campaign, and also being one of only about a dozen games ever to use the We Speak peripheral that you didn't know existed, which let you chat online with your party while playing, Monster Hunter Tri also featured a mission-based arena mode that you could play locally via split-screen. Aside from the three missions that are unlocked from the start, you would obtain up to seven more missions by catching specific monsters in quests during the main story. Then, in this arena, you and maybe a friend could battle those monsters and try to beat the target time to get a bunch of different rewards that I'll lump together since this game's called Monster Hunter Tri, and I'll call them Tri Points that you could then bring back to the story to upgrade your character more on your own system. Now, I'm not a huge Monster Hunter guy, but this apparently wasn't a super interesting feature on the Wii. Some players just sort of referred to it as a demo to try and convince other friends to buy the game, since the online play was just the full game but with friends, rather than this separate, segmented, very limited game mode. But whatever the case, I think it's kind of cool that you could transfer your character to the controller, bring it to a friend's house, and then bring back some of those try points to your own save file once you got back home. If this were the case for a more involved mode than just this little side mode, I would probably put this above My Sims as the best way a game used this whole controller saving gimmick, but it's a cool bone to throw out either way if nothing else. After 2010 and that aforementioned Club Penguin game, I couldn't find any later games that utilized the feature, which kind of makes sense since later software and even hardware revisions seem to have dropped the feature entirely. The Wii Mini, for example, doesn't have this feature included whatsoever alongside all of the other cutbacks that thing has, whether it's having zero online connectivity, no SD card slot, or any other thing they could do to try and cut costs. The Wii U's virtual Wii menus dropped the functionality as well, and the Wii channel itself seemed seems to have removed the feature on later base Wii models. Either that, or the Wii Remote revisions themselves cut the feature. I'm genuinely not sure, and Nintendo's own documentation doesn't help clear it up. Whatever the case, I'm surprised the idea even lasted past launch, let alone that studios found new and kind of innovative ways to use such a limited space as time went on. Now, with all of this said, you might be wondering why this sort of save data couldn't just be saved to a proper memory card. Wouldn't that just be easier? Well, for one, at least as far as I can think of, there are only a couple games that actually ever used two memory card slots at once. Time Splitters would let you save and load multiple player profiles, although I believe only one per memory card, if my memory serves right. In Animal Crossing on the GameCube, you could load your save in memory slot A and then visit the town in slot B, like if you brought your card over to a friend's house to show your friend your village. And in Guilty Gear Iska, you could simultaneously load from multiple save slots, so that each player could fight with their own version of that game's customizable character, Robokai 2. Again, I am certain there are others out there that I'm missing. There's probably some sports game that has a multi-tap feature where you could link up eight Madden games and save files and play a franchise mode or something like that. That, that has to exist, I'm sure. Do let me know in the comments which ones I'm missing. But generally, pulling data simultaneously from multiple memory cards just wasn't a thing that was done all that often, so I guess it also wasn't the most elegant solution here for such a small thing like moving me. Plus, although the Wii, at least the very first models, did have GameCube memory card slots, it couldn't use them unless you were playing GameCube games. And even though the system has an SD card slot, it took until 2009 for Nintendo to add an SD card manager app via system update. Prior to that, you had to manually transfer anything over to internal storage whenever you wanted to actually use it. Not to mention, who wants to carry around SD cards with them? You could just throw one of those things in your pocket and suddenly it's gone forever and so are all your saves. 
Lastly, there's USB storage, which would be easy enough, but the only Wii game I could think of that let you use USB memory sticks was Dragon Quest X, solely because that game had two discs and needed to install them to that USB stick. So, uh, well, in short, the Wii Remote Save solution seems to actually have been a pretty solid one, again, as limited as it was. As a fun little bonus fact, by the way, the Wii U's gamepad actually has a similar onboard storage thing going on. Every gamepad has 32 megabytes of storage specifically to be able to store any possible firmware updates to the gamepad, as well as act as a region lock. Because, you know, the one thing the Wii U needed was for its expensive controller to eventually be even harder to find over time as more and more of those gamepads start to fail. Great. Anyway, that's pretty close to the full story behind one of the many weird features that game consoles have had over the years, and it's a rabbit hole I went down solely because of fucking my sims. If you want another answer to a question you've probably never had until I ask it right this moment, check out my video diving into the intricacies of how multi-disc video games like Final Fantasy worked on different systems over the years. It's another fun one, plus I get to talk about the 8-disc Sega Saturn game, so, you know, you should, you should check it out. Thanks for watching, and as always, until next time, stay golden. A special thanks to wonderful Patreon supporters like Cloudy Boy, Goldstorm07, Josh Gourmet, Jump Rock, Common CJ, Karatana, and more for making videos like this possible. If you'd like to get early or ad free access to these videos, join the exclusive Discord server, and more, visit patreon.com/slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.